Um, I'll stand because I'm so okay. short. Sure people at the back might not see me. Um, <clears throat> so um, one one thing that I find really interesting about this event and uh, very exciting is it's an attempt to bridge Greek and British and European experiences. So what I thought I'd do is I'd give you kind of a British case study that a lot of you here may be familiar with. Um, but um, I hope the status will, will sort of feed it will feed into that because you'll see I think quite strong parallels between the Greek and the British situation. Um, I'll bring them out a bit more in discussion, or, or you know, feel free to chuck in your own thoughts as, as, as we go into discussion. Um, but treat, well, treat what I'm going to say is kind of the British case study. Uh, and over here, as you would have seen in the um, in the papers today and this week, a lot of our discussion still remains around the banks and the role that the banks play in our political thinking and in the lack of growth in this country. Um, so where do I begin? Well, let me begin by offering you a deal. The deal is this. You pay me £17,000 each. What do you get for that in return? Well, it's a good question. Because I can't promise that I'll pay it all back. Um, I probably won't do it to, you, to, to do any um, good works. But I can give you one guarantee, which is I will use your hard-earned dosh, your £17,000 from each of you in this room, to live in the style to which I've grown accustomed, which I'm sure you'll agree is actually quite a good bargain. Now, you may think that's ridiculous, but some of you, I'm sure, probably think that is quite a good deal. So who's up for Who's up for giving me 17 grand in your pockets? What happened to the generosity of you well-heeled Cambridge types? <laughs> um, well, some of you will have guessed that actually that transfer, that deal that I'm talk talking about, has already happened in this country in between 2008 and 2009. Um, every man, woman and child living in the UK is already on the hook to £16,821 each. And that money has gone to the banks. According to the IMF, the total cash committed to the finance sector is well over a trillion pounds. Over a trillion pounds in bailouts, loans or government guarantees on banking activities. With barely any debate or discussion, in a few brief months between 2008 and 9, every household in the country subbed £40,000 towards the city. And, I don't know how many of you have got to see Mervyn King this morning in Parliament, we still have no idea how much of this money we're going to get back, or when. If you go by how much the finance industry pays the Exchequer in taxes, it could take well over three decades. Perhaps you think I'm exaggerating. If anything, that's an understatement. Because the IMF study into the cost of our bank bailout was done in spring 2009. And a lot's happened since then. We're nearly £400 billion has been pumped into the finance sector by the Bank of England through its quantitative easing scheme. And as you're probably aware, every few months, George Osborne and Merlin King come up with some new scheme to pump extra billions into the finance industry in a bid to get them lending to the rest of us. And as you probably saw this week, the evidence so far is that those, that money is not going towards small businesses and is going to some degree towards mortgages and households, but not very successfully. A trickle rather than a flood, you might describe it. Now, whenever one of these ingenious squeezes is launched, you get some minister popping up on the BBC explaining how they're meant to boost the economy. But more often than not, they're just a long-winded way of giving welfare to the bankers. So that 17 grand that I demanded from you at the beginning would surely be higher still if you worked out how much of this public money had been skimmed off directly by the financiers since. Meantime, as you all know, benefits and public services for the rest of us are being slashed away. The UK is going through its worst economic slump since the 1930s. You've probably heard by now quite a lot about this talk of a triple dip, about how we may be about to enter our third recession in four years. But actually, the single worst statistic I can think of is that Britain's annual national income, its GDP, is still around 4% below where it was in 2008, which is a remarkable shrinkage. 
as a country we're earning less than we were five years ago. Unemployment soared as, and this is crucial in Britain, as is the number of people forced to take part-time jobs. Meanwhile, those who are still in the job have seen those who are still in work have seen huge drops in our pay. Indeed, in the first year of David Cameron's coalition, the average earner saw the biggest fall in his or her wages since Margaret Thatcher came to power. And, according to the well-respected Institute for Fiscal Studies, workers would be no better off in 2016 than they were in 2002. Those leaving the university or school this summer will never recover from the harm done to their careers by the appalling jobs market which they join. All the evidence shows that if you join the labour market and the labour market in a slump at the point you join it, that does permanent harm to your career prospects. Meanwhile, those who are just about to start earning a degree, those about just to start with a degree, face a prospect spending up to £9,000 a year on tuition fees. Meanwhile, their parents, if they work in the public sector, face the final death rows of the guaranteed final salary pension scheme. And this is only the start. Because in Cameron and Osborne's own measures, over 80% of the cuts are still to come. They begin in earnest next month in April. So by the, by the end of this Parliament, the entire country will be drastically and permanently changed, in my view, for the worse. Let me give you a story which is actually not the worst story I can think of. It's just a typical story, and I'm sure you, you can come up with your own versions. But it's a story from my office. One of my friends at the office is a reporter called Gwyn. Uh, last April, he became a father for the very first time. His girl's called Lily. And a few hours after she was born, mother, daughter, father were relaxed in the hospital. And the midwife brought over this thing called Bounty Pack, a Bounty Pack, which is a little bag full of free samples of baby stuff and information about their benefits and health service facilities available to them. Now, the way Gwyn tells it, they start opening up this pack and they pull out all this free stuff. And then they get to the benefits. And they realise that half the benefits have just been abolished. So, the child trust fund, worth, potentially worth thousands, gone. Health and pregnancy grant, scrapped. Tax credits for childcare, slashed. And by the end, he's totted up that that baby Lily will end up thousands of pounds worse off than this should be born only three weeks before. Like I say, you've probably got your own stories to tell, set on similar grounds. Anyway, just as he's worked that out, the midwife tells him that their local breastfeeding classes have also been scrapped thanks to the cuts. The cuts that followed the banking crisis. Think about what lies ahead for Lily and the rest of her age group. Not just a hacking back of services and benefits for newborn babies and their parents, but sure start centres closing. School classes increasing size. Higher, edu higher education cuts, as I mentioned. Think too about care for our old and sick. Unless you're seriously loaded, that's going to get much worse too. And all of this can be traced back to the banking crisis. Now, yes, Cameron is responsible for how the pain is shared out and when. And yes, Britain's economy was dangerously lopsided before the crash. But that crash was triggered by our finance sector, which, by the way, initially cheered on those cuts. Meanwhile, as I say, the banks that brought on all this misery are still receiving their own welfare programmes and going unreformed. The government talks about a big overhaul for our finance sector, but it isn't meant to happen for another five years, and is in any case a pretty modest affair. Even people on the inside of the banking industry admit as much. It consists really making finance a bit safer, so you put up a few hurdles between risky casino banking and then the stuff on the high street that we all rely on, like direct debits and cash machines. But those hurdles, it becomes clear, are regularly getting easier and smaller to jump. Now, in my view, the big reason the banks have got us so lightly is down to a story. A story about the role they play in the economy. Now, most of you know this narrative already because you hear, you hear it often enough on the news or read it in the papers. And a version of it tumbles out every time some lobbyist or minister talks about the vital contribution banking makes to our tax revenues, to employment. You see it every time the government talks about how banks aren't lending to needy businesses, as if that's something they normally do. At best, these claims are overstated. At worst, they're just false. Yet what they amount to is a yarn that the crisis that has been caused by banks has gone berserk, but in normal times, they're a force for the good. This is what emboldened Bob Diamond, the former boss of Barclays, to declare that 
the period of remorse and apology for the banks needs to be over. That was just a few months before it was discovered that his bank had been involved in a massive market-fixing deal, the LIBOR scandal, and he had to leave. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? But the thing is that politicians say it too, because when George Osborne flies off to Brussels, as he did this week, what's he going to argue about? Not subsidies to rich farmers or the austerity packages imposed on Greece and Ireland. No, he wants to shield the city from any potential scrapping of, from any potential limiting of the bonuses they pay themselves. David Cameron, who flounced out of a Brussels summit in Christmas 2011, described finance as the Brit in the British national interest, a phrase which no politician has used of any industry in Britain in at least the last 15 years. Um, at my office, I asked the researchers in our library to go through all newspaper cuttings, to see if any politician ever used that phrase, the British national interest of any industry. We went back the last 15 years, which totaled some of our archives, we could never find any. Extraordinary that four years on from banking crisis, Cameron describes banking as being in the British national interest. So, where do we see this national interest? Does it provide jobs? That's the obvious place to start. Well, the good news is that the finance sector employs a million people in Britain. It doesn't sound bad. But compare it to manufacturing. Even after over a decade of shrinkage, manufacturing still employs two million people. Now, there are two odd things about those finance job figures. The first is that they're static. If you put them on a graph and you go back over time, you see that actually the finance sector never adds on jobs. That fig the figures remained around a million for over a decade. So during the boomiest boom that finance has ever known, it added no new net jobs. Second thing is that most of those million people who work in the finance sector don't actually work in the city. They're behind the counter, the high street branches. They're not the ones who see the big bonuses. They're not the ones who are worried about you know, limitations and trading or any of the regulation coming down the road from Brussels. At our big British banks, 80% of the staff work in the retail branches. You could throw whatever, you know, regulation, bonus capping, anything that Brussels thought of, and their position would be completely unaffected. Well, you say that, but you will remember that there's this thing about taxes. And one of the things that Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, New Labour used to say was, we must let these guys go, you know, go fairly lightly regulated. We must have this light touch regulation. Because they're such a big money spinner. They pay for the hospitals, the schools, and all the stuff that we enjoyed under Tony Blair. Right. How true is that? Well, if you tot up all the taxes paid by the finance sector, in six years up to 2008, which, like I say, the boomiest boom in financial history, the banks paid £193 billion. Which sounds pretty good, right? It's only just over half the sum that the manufacturing paid. Manufacturing business paid £378 billion in taxes. And of course, banks took, probably took back that £193 billion and then some in the bailouts that then followed. Now, when I make this argument to people, it's normally about the time that they're kicking with, it, with their comeback. What about lending? Because that's the point of banks. In the economist's dream world, you're meant to have banks to channel idle savings to places where they're meant to be productive. Well, it's, again, it sounds better in theory than it works out in practice. Every month, the Bank of England puts out these uh, figures on bank and building society loans. They're quite telling. In March 2008, just before the crisis reached its peak, just before Lehman Brothers fell over, just over three quarters of all lending in this country was either to other banks or on property for mortgages. Less than a quarter of all loans made by banks or building societies went to what you might call the productive part of the economy, businesses, non-financial businesses. In other words, in the spring of 2008, over three quarters of all bank lending was going towards pumping up the bubble. That wasn't directing money towards the deserving parts of the British economy. That was what I think of as epic capitalist onanism. Now, you would of course think that after having been for a banking crisis, after having a probing ditch you know, poured on them from the Daily Mail, the Guardian, the FT, members of the governing coalition, the Bank of England, that the banks have changed their ways. And you're right. Because if you go back to the figures from March 2012, you see that there's been a drop in the lending that's gone to finance property. 
to 74.7%. So now just under three quarters of all lending goes to finance property. And again, only just over a quarter goes to productive parts of the economy. Manufacturing, for instance, got just 2.5% of all loans in March 2012. Despite that, it still makes up over a tenth of the economy. What those figures are telling you is just how far the banks have moved away from the textbook simple role they're supposed to play in our economy, of simply funneling money from where it's not needed to where it is needed. Over the boom, the banks moved decisively, decisively from being mere conduits for economies of the economy's imagination to being actual players, to actually going rogue. And that's helped them become actually bad for the British economy. How did that work? Well, remember that banks got nothing really to capitalise on, apart from their position as gatekeepers to cash. So they went looking for fees and commissions wherever they could get them. They became predatory, in other words, and we, the customers, became their feedstock. In Britain, as you know, one of the big banking scandals of the past year has been about how plumbers in Hastings, small electrical shops in Beaudley, have been missold interest rate swap products, over, over expensive and over complicated loans with interest rates that varied in the bank's favour. You'd also know about the payments protection insurance scandal, which is now worth over £14 billion and counting. In America, the selling of mortgages used to be a two step process. You went to a mortgage broker, you went to a bank. During the subprime boom, it typically became a seven step process, with investment banks, rating agencies, and bond insurers all drawn in, each agent skimming off money along the way. One of the other services the finance sector can sell to clients is how to dodge taxes. Indeed, the IMF has identified the City of London as one of the world's biggest offshore financial service centres because of its expertise in helping the super rich pay as little tax as possible. And this is expertise which is now being used in Britain. I don't actually know if the Germans are unlucky enough to have an equivalent to Jimmy Carr, but I doubt if their stand up comedians routinely turn themselves into companies listed in the Channel Islands. Who, turn, who pay, pay only 1% on their earnings. And it won't just be Jimmy Carr, they're boy bands, TV presenters, and Premier League footballers who are all at it. Thanks to the banks, tax dodging has become part of our national culture. Now, I want to be clear that the banking sector does contribute something. The trouble is, its main beneficiaries are the bankers themselves and the people who hang around them. We are talking, according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies again, we're talking by their estimates about a couple of football stadiums for the people who benefit the most during the boom. They're the ones who've got the telephone number, salary, the big bonuses, the incentive packages. It's a funny way to run an economy for the benefit of such a small group of people. And yet, Britain tells you, it does happen. So much for the economic. What about the social? Because those people in 1% need places to live to go and eat, socialise. Well, I joined The Guardian in 2007. That Christmas, I went to a nightclub for my paper called Mavida in central London. Its clientele was bankers, foreign businessmen and footballers, the sort of people that the Occupy movement turned to 1%. Now, I was lucky because I was going as a representative of Her Majesty's Press, so I got him free. But it would cost typically a, a couple of thousand pounds just to reserve a table. Which, when you get inside, is a bit weird, because the queue up outside, it's a nightclub underneath the theatre that plays Lion King. You queue up, uh, and there are all these nice young women who've turned up from Surrey for some reason, uh, and you go inside, and it looks like, like a normal nightclub, playing pretty poor house music. But the thing is this, every so often the music would stop, and the DJ does this funny thing. He stops the house music, and he puts on the theme Superman. So I'm asking the press handler, why is this happening? Why am I listening to the theme of Superman every half an hour or so? And he says, oh, well, the thing is this, they bought some champagne. Um, right, so people are buying champagne and they're celebrating by paying the theme to Superman. He goes, oh, no, no, not just any old champagne, not just a glass of champagne or a bottle of champagne. They have to buy a magnum of champagne to qualify to get the Superman theme played. <laughs> so, just after I've heard that explanation, <coughs> The DJ stops the music and puts on the theme from Superman. And I'm not joking, this time someone's ordered three bottles, three magnums. So the lights go off and three waiters come out, 
carrying above their heads these white shallow basins, a bit like the lampshades, but shallower. And on top of each, they've got these magnums with a sparkler stuck at the end. And the funniest thing is that everyone in this nightclub starts clapping along to the theme tune from Superman, or someone's getting shelling out 21 grand for some champagne. Now, if it were just about some people inside a nightclub, I, I actually, that would bother me less. You might think that's tasteless, but so what? But the point is this. All of this lavish consumption makes life more expensive for the rest of us. It's true in London, it's true in Cambridge too. It raises how much we pay in restaurants, shops, but most of all, on property. You see it very clearly in this corridor between London, Cambridge, Oxford, that as central London property prices rocket, those in surrounding areas become more and more expensive. So that middle classes have got to move into shoeboxes in good catchment areas, and working classes get priced out altogether. You see this very, very clearly in London now, where the people who work in banks get to live in London, and the people who clean the banks have to come from outside London at night on three buses, and then go out again in the early hours on three night buses. The economic geographer Dan Dawling describes this as the upstairs-downstairs effect that the rich now live in areas where the rest of us can only visit. Except, he's not talking about the wings of a house, he's talking about the wings of a country. That's not all the fault of the banks, of course, but it's a byproduct of the historic inequality which they help cause. Now, the thing is this, if the economic arguments are so firmly stacked against investment bankers, and if the social harm that's been caused by this big boom has been so bad, then why is it that the politicians still cling on to them? Because there is no doubt that they cling on to. There is no doubt that they can still get ministers to describe them as being in the national interest. They can still get the Chancellor's Secretary to fly to Brussels and make himself the most unpopular man in a room full of, full of, six, you know, full of his counterparts by, by arguing against the capping of bonuses. So why is that? Well, part of the answer is financial. Bankers use the boom to buy themselves influence. So that according to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, the city now provides half of all Tory party funds. Now that's up from just 25%, just only five years ago. Another part, I think, is cultural. Never forget that running this government are two sons of bankers. Cameron's father was a stockbroker, and Clegg's is still, I think, chairman of the United Trust Bank, and famously helped get him some work experience in the bank. And of course, Labour spent so long outsourcing all their economic thinking to Gordon Brown and their balls, that it's long lost since lost its ability to argue against the orthodoxy of giving the city what it wants. And Ed Balls, every three months, will take a train down to Clary Wharf and have dinner with bankers to talk about his economic policy. And then finally, I think, apart from the financial, apart from the cultural, I think part of the reason is intellectual. If you're the average mainstream politician of whichever mainstream party in this country, then you're going to believe in bringing more markets to our health and education and the rest of public services. So how on earth are you going to pick a fight with the self-appointed champions of those market forces? Now, in a poorer country, you might describe the coziness of relations between banks and politicians as cronyism. In Britain, I think we need to come up with a new term. The one that I particularly favour is bankocracy. Ruled by the banks, for the banks. Actually, it's not my derivative, not my original term. It's in the capital volume mark. You'll see it mentioned in Marx. But there is about bank crap these people benefit from the government bond yields. Who I think is actually used to describe this cabal that now runs Britain, this sort of fine, political financial complex. Here's the last question I'll leave you with, and I think this is very relevant to the Syriza Raymond trying to think about alternatives. Because before you need an alternative, you need some form of identifying where the sources of opposition are. So where is it? Where, for instance, is the academic opposition? Good question to ask in Cambridge. Well, <coughs> you can forget about most economists because they didn't see this crisis coming because their models simply didn't account for bankers going rogue. But the really sad thing to me is that no other discipline has got the intellectual self-confidence now to tackle what look like economic subjects, even though they're really to power. So, where are the sociological papers, for instance, on how finances have arrogated so much power? Where are the political scientists, for instance, writing about how bankers hijack the EU negotiations over restructuring Greece's debt? I haven't seen any of those. You do get a few academics, but the, and the, the, the key word there is few. So, the field is left to a few academics, the old NGO, 
Rothbard protesters, if you remember them, and some malcontent journalists. You do your campaigning, we write our pieces, and the academics publish a new left review, whichever other journals. I try as I might, you know, however sunny I might feel, I can't describe it as joint up thinking. And yet, yet, let me leave you with two causes of optimism. The first is, as I say, the facts are actually on our side. If you do want to restructure, if you do want to loosen the grip that banks have got on our economy and on people thinking, you can't argue with statistics. In fact, every month goes by and you see yet another note of exasperation from the Bank of England, from Mervyn King in particular, but increasingly now from people in government about why aren't banks doing what they're meant to do? We gave them all this money and they're still not playing the book, playing the game. The second thing is this, and actually this is drawn directly from Mervyn King. At the end of last year, maybe summer last year, Mervyn King made a statement in which he said, we are halfway through this slump. 2012, four years on from the great crisis of 2008. If you take it as word, that means we're not getting out until 2016 at the earliest. And if you look at our growth projections, which will be updated at the time of the budget in two weeks' time, um, it looks actually more and more likely that it's going to be extended out until later and later in the decade. As slump continues in a country as unequal as Britain is now, during the time of mass austerity, spending cuts being made, I refuse to believe that this system can hold. That it won't be the, actually, the, we will not reach another point, and uh, probably pretty soon, you know, the, the, the majority of benefit cuts come in this April. You start seeing the first big tranche of benefits cut come in this April. Um, and you start to see, as more and more people can't join the labour force, you see greater, greater discontent. I wonder now, if you went for another banking crisis, which I wouldn't want, you know, discount at all, despite the protestations of the ECB, despite the Bank of England's support, if you went for another banking crisis now, and if we got anywhere near bankers asking for 17 grand, or even 7 grand, I wonder how many of us would pay up this time. Thank you.